the Sportsline Podcast continues as we cap off the month of January. Thank you so much for checking in. I'm your host, Bubba O'Neill. As I say on a daily basis, this podcast is a space for the many extraordinary athletes, coaches, executives, broadcasters that got their start right here in the Golden Horseshoe and have made their mark nationally and internationally. Folks, I believe this is individual is our very first 5 tool player. He's a native Hamiltonium that was an athlete of the year at Carl. Cardinal Newman High School. He attended McMaster University and on the football field set records and earned national all-star status. His skills advanced him to the Canadian Football League where he became a hometown hero, playing the majority of his 12-year career with the Tiger Cats. Post-retirement, he was everything from a businessman, a restaurant owner, a sports broadcaster, and now he's the commissioner of the largest professional sports league in the country for the Canadian Elite Basketball League. Mike Morielli, you're in the house. Thank you so much good. for joining us. And I love the new digs. This is this is nice. This mm-hmm. is nice. I'm I'm enjoying well, it. Thank you. The nice coach. <laughs> Yes. Well too. Yes. Nice sporty feel here that we got going on, right? T- Tommy, it, this has been quite a journey for you, and I just kind of reeled off a couple of things, you know, from kind of the beginning and where it started and and, and where it's been. First of all, you're in your off season right now in the yep. CEBL. What are you doing with yourself? Oof, this is the busy time, right? Mm-hmm. This is where, you know, it, from my perspective, it's it's more strategy, uh, long-term planning. Where are we going next? We've made some adjustments moving into 2024, um, made some changes. We've got some further adjustments and changes, all for the better in 2025 and beyond. But it's about continuing the growth, right? You can never take your foot off the gas. It, Canada's a big country. It's not easy to run a sports league in this country it's mm-hmm. so vast and wide but we've managed to to make a name for ourselves and and that's that's important and now it's just about you know not having that slump right always being ahead of the curve trying to think four or five steps ahead but um i got a great staff great ownership um and it's onward and upwards and you're one of the few leagues that went through the covid and you came up with a plan with the summer slam you survived have we cleared that it seems to be because you've expanded the league yeah we've i think Going into this year, we've had some great growth, and, and COVID was uh, horrific for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were able to see the silver lining because we got through it, mm-hmm. and a lot of others didn't. And that kind of galvanized us as a staff, mm-hmm. as a players bought in. They're like, mm-hmm. okay, these guys believe in us. Nobody took a pay cut. Nobody mm-hmm. took a haircut. It was, you're getting paid. This is what we're doing, and we're going to make it work. Mm-hmm. And it was difficult, but we got through it, and it got through the next year of COVID again without fans and and we, you know, establish yourself as a league that was doing things before others. Um, and then last year with some configuration, addition of, you know, the Calgary's and the mm-hmm. Winnipeg's, and then we really feel like we're coming into our own. And, you know, if we look at our numbers now versus where we were at this point last year, we are miles ahead and miles and miles, which is very good indicators of where we're going to go in 2024. And I think a lot of that success is getting into those markets, playing in the right building, as we're seeing with the with the uh, the professional women's hockey league, and we saw with the CFL in in certain situations, playing in those right buildings and getting the television as part of the product has been a huge help. Yeah, us us landing TSN and, and no discredit to CBC was where we started. It was the right place for start. It was the awareness factor, but we had to be on a dedicated sports station. It just. It was in too important not to, and the perception of being on that station elevates your brand. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really attracts eyeballs, not just domestically, but other places. And it really acts as a, a way to make the business better. So that has been really, really big for us. Um, it, it's an important you know, growth part of where we're going to, and not just domestically, but getting more linear games on TV, getting more access to you know, fans watching us all over the world. Uh, basketball is a global game, and that's really helped us. And we play at a time when there is very little to no basketball mm-hmm. professionally. So it opens up people's eyeballs and, you know, their wallets sometimes as you just talk about, you know, the betting component of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's really going to be and has been the part of our league that's really been uh, I guess the secret sauce is when we play and the access to players and access to a time when there is no other basketball. What are players telling you? Players love it. Mm-hmm. Players love it. Um, they've been our best advocates. Uh, I've, I've, you know, in my background, being a player, but being 
leading a, an association, I always have a lens of, okay, what's the player think? Mm -hmm. You know, how is this going to impact the player? We want to make positive impacts on players, not negative. Uh, we've increased our salary cap this year, a substantial amount. We've added a couple new wrinkles to allow for, you know, our per game salaries to go up by removing certain players from the salary cap. And these are all done in a way to make sure the, the individual players, uh, you know, benefit. But it's not just the time they spend here, it's the time they spend after here and the new opportunities they have in Europe or the access to the NBA or the G League and the pathway. So if we continue with the pathway, continue to compensate players appropriately, provide these amazing experiences in the spring and summer in Canada, which mm -hmm. is a fantastic time to be here. For sure. Um, it, it all comes together as a destination. Right. And if you become a destination, and especially for the right players, then it just snowballs because they tell each other and there's just word of mouth that happens. And, and I think that's the – you've been around long enough now where we're starting to see the – for the player side, I'll, I'll keep it here for the, – the, 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 like you said, the secret sauce here. Yeah. Because, uh, Lindell Washington with Wigington. Like, guys, all of a sudden, they're in the NBA. Wait, now, didn't I just see that guy in the CEBL? Yeah, there's been – we've had 14 guys go through to the NBA and NBA contracts. you got, you know, several probably – 40, 50 plus on an annual basis, go to the G League and come back. So that relationship with the G League, the NBA on the basketball side is very nice. And it's, you know, you stay in North America, you can play all year round, you get compensated right. Um, and you're getting seen, you're getting noticed, you get the name on the back of your jersey. So this, everybody has, and when I go across the, the league and in all the cities to start the year, I talk to all the teams. I say, mm -hmm. I, I don't know why you're here. Like everybody has your own individual story. Mm -hmm. But I do believe you can you can accomplish what you need to accomplish in this league. And, you know, you have the platforms here to do it. And we've seen it happen. And we continue to get recurring players and some more consistency in that. But we're also able to attract new players that people haven't seen before or maybe want to check out what we're all about. And that's that's the encouraging part. You are, you know, and I know this is maybe something you'll look back long past retirement or whatever, I mean, from all of this professionally, but you have set the standard and an example for many people, not only in Hamilton, but across the country as someone that started at one level, did so many things, learned so many lessons and gotten yourself to where you are today. Let's start back at McMaster, right? <laughs> Let's go back to the some big good basket. days there. It's not so many wins, but we had a lot of good <laughs> <Yeah>. times. <laughs> and that was that was a growth time for the, yeah. you know, we had the Les Prince field with the grass that was about this long. I always remember. Oh, God. Tough it, to run already. I'm already slow enough. I didn't need the <laughs> tall grass to you know, slow me down. But I mean, you had some good days at McMaster, mm -hmm. and, it, and it fostered you on to the Canadian Football League. What was that journey like? Well, when I was in high school, I, I, I've been blessed. First of all, I grew up in a, in a football family. Like, the Morielli side loved the Ticats. And my grandpa went back to the HAAA grounds and the Jim Trimble days and watching the first forward pass and all this stuff. So I grew up in the his brothers and sisters, so my great aunts and uncles, and it, it obviously went downhill. So, and then on the other side, on the Masadi side, I got, I got you know, Paul is playing and then Christian's getting a chance to play. And that this is like, okay, my eyes are open to – an opportunity and being a fan first and sitting at Ivor Wynn and and watching Ben and Rocky and Grover and Rufus and I mean mind-blowing to me heroes uh, yeah heroes and, and it's funny you say that when you look back it's hard for me to even put myself in their shoes that I played on the same team on the same field like it's kind of hard right mm -hmm. it just I kind of separate myself from that but going to Mac wasn't an easy decision to me because I had been Football, 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 my, you know, the minute I started playing, which is grade 10, I didn't start till later. And I just felt like this is what I want to do. And I would do anything to get to that level. And it was always the CFL for me. That's that's what I wanted. And um, didn't want to go to Mac because Mac was in my hometown and I wanted to go out east or I wanted to go down south. And, and as I started looking at that, uh, there was a guy by the name of Steve Bruno, who was the, the coach at the time. No relation to Al. Al came after. Mm -hmm. It was also my coach. Uh, mm -hmm. But... Steve was a relentless, relentless recruiter and for years and years and years. And, and finally I said, you know what, I'm going to take a visit. I've never visited <laughs> McMaster. I had no idea. Never been to the campus, never lived, you know, in Stony Creek, Hamilton my whole life. 
So I went to go look and I said, man, this is nice down here. This is a good spot. And then slowly I started hearing about, you know, Ryan Hudecki and Jason Foley and all these guys from, from uh, St. Mary's and then other guys are coming from OP. And then I'm saying, oh, this is turning into like a, a Hamilton crew. And, and you know, I, I always believed the Hamilton football is some of the best football around. I still believe that mm-hmm. to this day. So I thought, okay, this just changes my mindset on, on where I want to go. Maybe I can stay home and maybe I could be successful. And then with that recruiting class, I just felt really comfortable and, you know, we didn't win a lot. I, I never had a winning season mm-hmm. in four years there. But, man, we, you know, we had such a good group of guys, and it taught me a lot of lessons. And there wasn't a lot of support for Mac football like there is now. You know, we were past the, the glory days of Bernie Custis and, right. and Phil Scarfone, and we were before the, you know, the days of Ben Chapdelaine and all that. And Jesse. And, and, Jesse yeah. and Kojo. So I kind of fell in the middle, and you know, along with our teammates. So it was a bit of the lost years, but, boy, they were built some resiliency. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I would train on my own, get up early in the morning to try and use some facilities because they weren't open to me during the day. And mm-hmm. I think that all that made it tougher and I had a great support of teammates and um, we played a style of game that allowed me to grow as a receiver mm-hmm. I, I was I was very lucky to play at Cardinal Newman under a offensive coordinator or head coach and Don Fernside and Bob Nordoff who threw the football that mm-hmm. was very rare yes. in in high school and, yeah at that time right and it's a, it was a four down game and they just most teams ran so that got me used to that and then at mac we we were not afraid to throw the football sometimes we had to throw the football mm-hmm. we didn't have a choice <laughs> and so i just learned by being part of it and i think you know i could have went to western and probably rode the bench for three years and then maybe played my fourth year and maybe been successful had maybe more trophies and, and more awards and but i wanted to play because mm-hmm. there's nothing replaces playing and i got considerably better because of my teammates in practice, but from playing in a game. See, I think CIAU at the time, yes, yes, All Star, yeah, yes, yeah, you, oh yeah. At that time, you're, you're you're you know getting an All Star nomination there. You're you're breaking McMaster school records as a you know in terms of receptions and yards. You get drafted by the BC Lions, and somehow you land with the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Like, this is like a Hamilton guy, plays a McMaster, gets to the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Yeah. Pressure? Excitement? Um, You know, I was, my excitement of getting drafted to BC was off the charts, and that didn't, you know, my excitement waned pretty quickly after about four days in camp when they (laughs) sent me packing, and then I'm like, oh, well, that wasn't what I anticipated. But I did get drafted my third year which was a choice that I made because I thought, okay, if things don't work out, I'll come back to Mac. Uh, I was in the honors program. I took my BA in my third year. And I figured, okay, if I come back to Mac, I'm going to play football and I'm going to take some courses that I think interest me, right? That's a good landing spot if things don't work out. So that happened. I came back. I was still a, a million percent in on football, but I started taking business classes, started taking, like doing things a little bit more casually and enjoying that part. And, um, Lo and behold, Toronto picked me up, and a lot of people in Hamilton hate hate to hear that story, but mm-hmm. it's just part of my journey. Um, but the chance to come home to Hamilton was the greatest decision I ever made, you know. And it, um, I'm glad it worked out that way. And no matter how many times I bounced here and here, you can't take everything out of me that's Hamilton. It is what it is. It's part of me, right? I got to th- I got to ask you the question. I mean because yeah, and I remember those days you were seen as a Hamilton hero playing for the Tiger Cats. I, what what a story. What an example for young kids in Hamilton. Mm-hmm. You can do this. Then you as you said, you're wearing the double blue. And Ooh. and those visits to Ivor Wynn, I remember oh. a couple of receptions <laughs> and I remember a couple of drops where the people let you know. Oh, and that was when I played in Hamilton they were letting me know. I remember <laughs> when I played when I went to Toronto, I mean, we laugh about it now, but I was the second coming of O'Shea, right? Mm. Osh was and you know what Osh got when yes. he left. And so I replaced O'Shea in terms of, okay, he's the next guy we're gonna get on and he <laughs> he left us and and I think, you know, not everybody knows the inner workings of what goes on in the decisions to leave. Of course you know, not, no. My decision to start in Toronto was different. I had no choice. They signed me? Absolutely. I'm playing in the CFL. I don't care. When I, after two years of playing in Toronto, it was my choice as a free agent. I wanted to come to Hamilton. And then after five years and, and a lot of success in, you know, certainly 98, 99, 2000, into 2001, you've been there now for, I was there for five years in a row. Um, 
you know, it, it started to get almost like a bit stale, not necessarily for me, but you can feel where there needed to be some changes. You know, we had the kind of same coaching staff. We had some new players come in. You could see my role changing. And I just didn't feel like there was that love that was there before. And I also felt like I think I need a change um, because I think I need a kickstart myself, right? I think I need, it's not going to be an easy change. And I think in hindsight, I wouldn't change a thing, by the way, but in hindsight, my one regret is I didn't go out, at, out west to play, right. to get that experience, right? But I did what was best for me at that time and the opportunities available to me. And going to Toronto, what made it easier is that I ended up playing with a lot of guys that I played with in Hamilton, mm -hmm. right? And it, it softened that blow sure. in the locker room. Mm -hmm. But when I came back to Hamilton on Labor Day, <laughs> and I'll never forget, you know, uh, Pinball was the coach at the time, and in typical pinball fashion, you know, they call out the um, the coach, or pardon me, the, the captains for the game on Labor Day, and he puts out every captain is every Hamilton player that has moved to Toronto. And he <laughs> purposely does it. And as I'm walking players, out, just can you remind? It was uh, <laughs> Jeff Johnson. It might have been like Adriano Belli and ah. myself, and uh, Joe might have been uh, there at the time, yes. Montford, because he went back. So it was it was a way to fan the flames, mm -hmm. and they, they it, instantly, you know, at that point, what was there, twenty seven to thirty thousand people at that point screaming, "More Yelly sucks!" And I thought. <laughs> Well, at least they care. I mean, you know, it was it was a moment I'll never forget. It was it was amazing because it just showed the passion of the decision in real life, right? It was it was kind of neat. It's a cardinal sin. It's a sin. I still <laughs> believe me. I wear the velvet. What's it called? The velvet whatever. Oh man, I can't escape it. I'd never wear my Grey Cup ring, Toronto Grey Cup ring in Hamilton. Never. Never. You know, and speaking of Grey Cup, but just before you go to Toronto, there's some years here. At 98, 99, the, the little general comes in, the whole yeah. Tiger Cats program come in. At 98, you win the All-Canadian Award. Like, I mean, that, that's got to be the basis of, like, I'm doing something well here. Yeah. And, then, and then eventually that rolls into the Grey Cup victory in 99 where, you know, there are so many people that on that squad that are legendary Legend. to this city just talk to me a little bit about those days and how special it was to to wear the black and gold oh my god i mean it, it's kind of crazy to think this year will be 25 years since the you know we won that cup and no other team has won since then that that pisses me off i wish <laughs> you know i don't want to be the last and none of our none of my teammates want to be the last but you know Come, when Ron came in, that was that was the turning point, right? Um, I came here in '97. We were two and sixteen or four and fourteen. At, you know, at, at that point, who remembers? We didn't do well. We went through eleven quarterbacks. We run Calvillo out of town. We're basically starting from scratch. But we had a good squad. We had a, you know guys that can play. And then Ron was the first guy to turn to myself and to Andrew Grigg within days of taking the job and saying, "You're going to be my starting receivers this year." That was a game changer because no one had ever said that to me. Like we were situational players. We would run plays in, Andrew and I, in sure. 97. And my first couple of years I was, you know, I got some playing time, but I wasn't the, a bona fide starter. So. You were the typical Canadian yeah, player. Yeah, I was the guy that went over the middle, got the crap kicked out, yeah. which I did my whole career, by the way, <laughs> um, and loved it. But Ron was the first one to instill in that, and instill that confidence. And then he was also the one to say at training camp, the guys in this room are the guys I want here at the end of the year. Now, it doesn't always necessarily work that way, but there was a commitment to keeping everybody together because he believed in us and all we had to do was do our job. But the relationships, the friend, friendships that were built among that team, I mean, we've, we've talked about it publicly on length. When we see each other, it, we lit, it's, it's family. Like, it's, it's part of who I am. It's part of what allowed me to grow to, to what, you know, the person I became and I was challenged and we had lots of laughs and lots of good times and we won. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I don't know if, if you can replicate a lot of that anymore just because of, we didn't have distractions back. There was no distractions. We, we practiced at one third in the afternoon, but to a man, we were there at eight in the morning mm -hmm. playing cribbage and playing dominoes and playing foosball and yeah, working out and doing the other stuff too. But you've been in those locker rooms. We had a lot of fun and it was, you need a thick skin <laughs> to get in that locker room and to stay in there. But there was no black and white. 
there was no American Canadian. There was no young and old. And we had guys like Lamar McGriggs and Calvin Tiggle that said he put people in their place, right? There, there never felt like anybody overstepped. Right. We all had our role. We all identified what it was and we're successful doing it. You have this great career and then out of nowhere, and again, the love affair with the Hamilton uh, uh, Hamilton fans with you, I mean, it, it's at its height right now as you're a veteran player. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you again, there's another guy as well, too, in the likes of Rob Hitchcock, who kind of, you know, he went to a different, he went to the United States, but he, he too was a Hamilton guy that built his reputation, another all-star player. And, and there's a kind of a linkage between the yeah. two of you, the Bob C twins. Yeah, I used to hear oh, yeah. the, some funny stories yeah. between the two of you, and I'm sure you had some great stories that we'll never hear about, and we probably <laughs> yes, should never hear agreed. about. <laughs> right? But there's all of a sudden this, I'll call, you tell me, a forced retirement. Yeah, it was tough. It still, like, it still lingers for Rob and I. I've, I've certainly gotten over it, but it took me a while to get over. Um, I was going into my... 13th training camp actually my 14th if you count the bc one but my 13th season uh, as was rob um there had been a changeover you know bob young had come in uh marcel desjardins was the new gm um scott mitchell was the new president at that time so there's a lot of hierarchy that had changed and i think they without pointing fingers i think they wanted to put their stamp on it and and new coach and Charlie Taft. There's a lot of stuff. Now the lead into the to the decision was what I think caught Rob and I off guard because when they saw in Charlie Taft, one of the first meetings we had was with him where he said, okay, you're, you're my vets, either side of the ball. I need you to help me here. You're going to help this team forge forward. We got a young team, you know, we, we've drafted, you know, pretty good, but we're young and, you know, we're coming off some tough seasons, but you guys are going to be on my base. So we, we were with with the understanding that that was our job and it kind of came natural because at that point in your career, you really have to be the leader right mm -hmm. on and off the field. So great training camp for myself. Uh, I know Rob had a good camp, but I was probably at that point, even at 36 playing some of my best football because the game had slowed down to a point where I just, I could recognize things so much easier. Mm -hmm. So getting the call to go downstairs at, in during training camp, was like a bit of a, didn't shock me because I was a, at that point a member at large of the Players Association We're in the middle of a collective bargaining agreement. It would be typical that I would meet with the front office and talk about, hey, where are we at? What's going on? Sure. But when I walked into the meeting downstairs and saw the faces sitting around and the, the Scott Mitchells and the Desjardins and, and Mike McCarthy and so whatever, I knew I walked into something that I didn't want to be in. I was like, this doesn't feel right. And I said, what's going on, guys? And they said, well, listen, we're – unfortunately, we're, we, we've made a decision to let, let you go. And, and, we, and I was like – I was shocked. And he said, we've also made a decision to let Hitch go. And when they said that, that took me. Because to me, it's like, okay, Hitch has not left. Hitch didn't go to Toronto. Hitch didn't go anywhere. Hitch has been the bona fide heart and soul of that defense for 12 years. And there's no way – like there's no one to replace Hitch. I don't. Uh, maybe this year they finally replaced them with, uh, with, uh, uh, Katz and Tony. Yeah, like, yeah, and like he plays like Rob does, yeah. right? And and sure. Craig Butler played with that edge. But sure. it was a while before that happened. So, long story short, we hear the news. We're crushed. Um, they wanted us to kind of retire and take a job in the front office, and they didn't have any ideas of what it was other than I think they wanted us to walk away quietly right. and I wasn't walking <laughs> quietly it wasn't gonna happen I just yes. didn't believe in it mm -hmm. and the Rob one really affected me so we went upstairs and Charlie Taff comes upstairs he wasn't in the meeting and he's he's like what's going on and we can see from the dorm there he has no idea he has no idea he has no idea so they're practicing on the field walking out to practice and we're in the, our dorm room and, and Taff starts to break down and we're like, listen, coach, like, I don't understand this. Like, we, this was our last year. Like, we're not playing beyond this. This was our year to go out. Like, we understand our role. And he's like, oh, one more. Do you want me to go down? We'll, we'll see if we can change it. I said, no, we're not. You can't change it. We just got cut. Like, there's, there was a disconnect. So that goes on. And then, you know, news is they want to go and have a press conference and, and announce this. And I said, well, you're not having a press conference without Rob and I. And I don't know if you were at that press conference. I was there. It was, I'll let you speak for yourself, but it was one of the 
strangest, awkwardest, <laughs> most awkward press conferences you've ever seen because you have, you know, senior leadership that's upset about a decision they made and two guys that still want to play, they're sitting and understanding why it's happening. And, uh, but that was kind of the point where I, I think we're like, no, like there's something here. Like Rob and I can't just sail into the sunset without you guys realizing we don't want to. No, oh, the decision I, is the decision. And I right? think this entire city knew that yeah. what? Like you, there's no way yeah. you're cutting our guys. It was and to go as a package was even worse. Like get just get rid of me if you don't want me or whatever, or just get mm -hmm. rid of Rob. But to put us together, and it's kind of in, in one way, it's linked us together ever since, mm -hmm. right? Um in in a good way. But it took me a while. It took me a good three or four years to like even want to know what was happening and, and because you get in sport you know you you always think you've got another play left in you and, and sometimes you don't in this case we thought we did and when it gets ripped out away it's it's tough but Ronnie Lancaster told us from day one you make them rip that jersey off the back you never never go out on your own you make sure they rip that jersey off your back that's the only way to leave so in, in some some respects that just galvanized the next stage of my life and you know what? And Rob would go on to play a year with the Eskimos, which was bizarre. I'll, yeah. I'll say Final that. three games of that season. <laughs> he he was, yep. seemed very bizarre. But you get into this part of life um, that, as you would know, and I think because you had ties with, with the uh, Players Association retirement, mm -hmm. that can be a very, I'll use the word scary thing for a lot of athletes because the practices, the workouts, the boys, the 18, 20,000 people aren't there anymore. Yeah, it's uh, torturous. It really is. It's uh, and the longer you play, the harder it is because there's a couple of things that happen. You, 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 your life has been on a schedule forever and you have all those fringe benefits and things that make you tick and it gets you going. And then, um, you know, you're entering the workforce and you're late thirties and it's not easy to compete against people that have gone to school and got their MBAs and all this other stuff. So it's like a void has been created. And I was just so blessed that, you know, all the work that I've been doing behind the scenes with the Players Association as a rep and executive that we helped create this, you know, uh, marketing uh, arm of the Players Association. And, and I was tasked to lead it. That was the soft landing that I, I don't know if that didn't happen where I, if this, I'd be talking to you like this now about where I am and what I'm doing because if I look around at all the guys I played with um, and against over a long thousands of players over you know a long career, a vast majority of them have struggled and continue to struggle. And um, you know, in my role as president, I would face that head on, and it wasn't pretty. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just fortunate. The others. They gave everything to football, but when football's done, football's done, right? I was able to live in the city I played, and it helped soften that, and then still be involved in football meant that I was around that environment, right, mm -hmm. that I craved. Wasn't playing, but that's okay. I still got the, mm -hmm. the vibes. But um, those are, you know, for anybody, no matter what league you play in, you know, and the length of time you play, it's, it's a sharp drop at the end. Mm -hmm. The best part for you is that family life, really kicks in wife two kids and then next thing you know a basketball not a football becomes a major part of your life how did that all happen again it's it was the challenge right i i when i was in the cfl i i believe and i thought about this on the way up you know i've been in professional sports in canada for 30 years that's ridiculous. It's, to me, it's like a ridiculous number. I'm like, that's crazy. But I always believed that I had value um, off the field just because I felt, and at that time I had picked up the broadcasting uh, mm -hmm. stuff first with the score and then with the others. And so I had a very well-rounded look at, you know, all my roles with the PA and as a player with what made the league tick. So I was hoping that I could infiltrate into the CFL or a team level at some point. Of course, with the tie Cats would have been my where I would love to go, but I just, it's tough, tough to crack that group of, of people that have been together for so long in the tradition. So, you know, that started to wane and wane and wane, but the desire to be on the business side of sport was always intriguing to me. But in Canada, it's a very, very limited opportunity, That's right. very limited. 
uh, you know, and less limited now because of the CBL and the CPL. But other than that, there was the CFL as the only domestic league, mm-hmm. and uh, they weren't taking too many new joiners. <laughs> so, um, long story short, I just I used that kind of as a resolve to say, okay, well, I'm not going to change my desire to be, but you know, I got to start looking at other things to do. And I took some jobs that I look back now and go, oh, that job sucked. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like real jobs, you know, now where I walked into like the lunchroom, I'm like, oh, this isn't like what I'm used to. <laughs> I better just say nothing and put my head down. <laughs> but man, you know, you have to struggle a bit, I think, to be able to really appreciate the next steps. And um, by chance, uh, one of the jobs I had, which was the, my final job before taking my role with the CBL was selling private jets. So it wasn't a bad private gig. jets. Yeah, it wasn't a bad gig. I didn't know this. This was a this was a good gig I got at the, <laughs> at the end, and I was quite lucrative, and it was very you know interesting meeting the top one percent of people and and the very first. So just per- selling selling time time yeah on fractional ownership of jet okay which is a very big business wow and actually ramped up because of COVID even more right the okay. security and the time and all yeah, that stuff true. saved. So the first, you know, meeting I had about Jess was with this gentleman named Richard Petko, who was interested in, 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 in who is now and was my boss and, and now and was the founder of the CBL, but at the time owned a team in a rival league, a league that I wasn't even aware of. And um, we befriended each other. He recognized me from the CFL. He was a Mississauga guy, so he kind of knew me from the Argos, which, mm-hmm. again, there was some shining light in being there the you Argos, go. right? There's got to be something. And... Um, he just started picking my brain on some of the problems he was having running a team in a league that really didn't have a lot of leadership. Mm-hmm. And he tasked me, he said, listen, I want, I want to put your name to be the commissioner of this league. And I'm like, well, I don't know anything about it, but let's check it out. And short, in, in short order, within five minutes of meeting the other owners, I just felt it wasn't for me. And I'd said to him, I don't know why you're spending your good money on this. There's just something's missing. You're doing a great job, but you'll never get to where you want to get to. There's just nothing there. And he said, well, that's why I sent you in. He goes, how about we do something on our own? And I said, okay, what'd you have in mind? He said, let's, I think we could play a FIBA style game in the spring and summer and, you know, do what has been done all over the world outside of North America, which is strong domestic sports leagues that generate incredible talent, right? And if you look at the World Cup or the Olympics, you see it in the best Teams are not always U.S. and Canada. There are Australia or, right. or France or Italy or whatever. So that started the path of, oh, this is cool. So I actually held on to my job of selling jets as I was sitting at a boardroom in Niagara of a team that was playing in another league. Mm-hmm. And I was sketching out the map to what this would look like. So I had, the, I had the general understanding of this is kind of the framework that mm-hmm. to work from. How do I make it work? Like, how do we attract players? How do we pay players? How do we, where do we play? What are the rules? And so it was like, you know, full steam ahead and it just captured me. And I love that creativity. And, and Rich, um, to this day, still is, is never told me what to do. Uh, I remember early on asking him, hey, you know, I got this idea about blank. And he says, Mike, I hired you to do a job. You're the expert, do the job. And that runway just gave me that, just revived me. And I'm like, okay, I'm off to the races. This is make it or break it. I'm putting everything I have into this thing. Amazing. You know, and the timing couldn't be better. Of course, you're looking at the Raptors championship. We're looking at a whole new community of people in Canada that don't always see hockey as right. number one. Yep. They see basketball as number one. And this is not just, you know, this is men and women as well, too. This sport is growing and, and, and your your league is growing. And there are so many great days I think you probably enjoy. And again, we'll probably we'll look back at later. Let me look back at one day mm-hmm. that really I can't, I'll never forget. The Scarborough Shooting Stars their debut home game was something I will never forget. Like, oh, it was like, 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 it, like, it, like, it, like, it was crazy. Like, there it is one time for the end. Like, like, it was incredible. And, 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 and you were, you know, gracious enough to give me great seats as a media member. And I'm sitting on courtside, and uh, Alec Manoa is beside yep. me. You're down the line. Marcia, there was like government, Maestro, Fresh West. And then all of a sudden, there's just this crowd of people that come in. 
and I look and I'm like, oh, it's uh, somebody big, and I'm t- it's Drake. <laughs> Drake is sitting right across from me. <laughs> I'm like, holy mackerel, Drake is right here. And now, uh, you, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I don't know if he had some ownership in it. And also playing on this team is J Cole. Like J Cole is. I know him for his music. I didn't really. I I had heard he could play hoops a little bit, but the fact that he was going to put himself in a you know playing against professional people was a was a shock to me. Yeah. Can you just describe that vibe of what was oh, going on that man. day? Well, I'll take you back a little bit before that when you know Nico Carino, who's Drake's best friend and and one of the owners of Scarborough, of OVO fame, uh, walked in uh, to my office said, "Listen, got this idea." And, and I, I, we're going to bring J. Cole. Drake talked to him. They were at a party last year, told him about the CBL, and he's he's in. He said, but he's, he's a little concerned over the way he was treated at the BAL, the Basketball Africa League. So he had tried, he had played the year before in the Basketball Africa League. He's a huge hoops fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, grew up in North Carolina, got all that old school mm-hmm. Tar Heel, you know, hoops. It, you know, started playing, you know, around university, wanted to play collegiately but then got into the music game but never that that dream never left him so I had that understanding so it wasn't hokey to me it was mm-hmm. like okay no I know the guy can hoop I, I'm not suggesting he's the best guy on the court mm-hmm. but you know oh, Nico's like but he's taking this seriously Mike like this is serious. I said well if it's serious let's let's start talking about it and mm-hmm. you know let's not abuse him he comes here, I'm going to treat him like a basketball player, like any other basketball player, and that's it. And you can let him know that. There'll be no special treatment, but there'll be no taking advantage of, of who he is. Mm-hmm. So unbeknownst to us, we didn't understand the impact of signing J. Cole. Like we, we thought, okay, this guy's arguably one of the top three, you know, uh, artists of the decade or of the century. Or, um, but what was, will his impact be on, on ticket sales? We didn't know. We prepared, but we underprepared for the onslaught that happened. And the first day that it was announced, for, and the lead up to that was crazy because I had Shams Charania mm-hmm. calling me almost every day. I heard Jay Cole's coming to play for Scarborough. I, I said, "Listen, I, I Shams, like, I can't confirm or deny that. Like, you know, an <laughs> insider back action again. And this is what I'm hearing. I said, "Okay, listen, Shams, you got to do me a solid here. <laughs> it's going to happen." but I need you just to hold tight until I know for sure that we can get this deal across the line. And then you got it. You go nuts. And to his credit, a guy like him, for people that don't know, he's one of the biggest NBA him insiders. Him and Lodge. Right? So, yeah. you know, I, I think back to my years of working with the media, it's just if you're fair to the media and you're honest with the media, they'll be honest back. Like, mm-hmm. they have a job to do. I think it, so I've always had that kind of relationship he trusted that I wouldn't sewer him, and I trusted him, and it worked out great. And he he announced it about an hour before we did, and mm-hmm. that was cool, and I was fi- fine with that. And then it blew up. And to your point about that day in Scarborough, like it was, you know, the Scotty Barnes, the Alex Manoas, Drake, and it's just, if you go back to me sitting at a desk in Niagara, Drake attending one of the CBL games would be like a mind-blowing phenomenon, mm-hmm. right? Because we knew he was a basketball fan, the Raptor fan, the ambassador. But for him to walk onto a CBL court would have been like, <laughs> it was insane. And there he is. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. And just soaking it all in, the experience was great. And, and I don't know if J. Cole scored three points that night or mm-hmm. five or whatever he did. The atmosphere that was created really sent some alarm bells off to say, okay, wow. It's not just basketball. It's entertainment, right? There's more here. We, we've got a little bit of you know, something going, Mm -hmm. it's starting to catch on. And this could be a a major step in, in where this league is, how this league is perceived, how it's recognized, how people are aware of it. And that was a a huge, huge moment. I don't want to get you too fired up. And and I'd be remiss here on this podcast. If I did not bring this up, Um, I was um, honored to attend Hamilton Honey Badger games. Look at you yes. laughing right there. And <laughs> so and, was I. You know, and and this was awesome. And it had to have been even better for you as a Hamilton guy to uh, you know you're the commissioner of this league and you got a team in your hometown. 
Um, and right now we don't have basketball, professional basketball being played in Hamilton for various reasons. We don't have the Ontario Hockey League playing right. their games um, and uh, we'll soon lose the cross for, you know, for the obvious reasons of reconstruction of the arena. But um, your feelings on the fact that right now, this year as we stand, the Hamilton Honey Badgers could be, could have been. Could have been still playing. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, I, I wrestled over that, and if you go back to the very beginning, there have been there were some very profound people, well, you know, uh, that understand the sporting landscape that told me do not put a team in Hamilton, do not, for various reasons that I'll keep private, and um, I, you know, I just and I still believe, but at the time I believe, well, no, this is important to me, like personally, this. This is a market, and I grew up understanding the transways and, and the Burbuff basketball and, and the MAGA basketball and all these things. I knew there was a good basketball community here, and I'd seen it firsthand. So I said, no, 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 like we can make it work. I think what, what I underestimated was the venue, the people wanting to come downtown, people, you know, making that a destination. Um, it was a little bit more difficult. It wasn't the decision that we're not here. We were, we were continuing to grow that market and we had, we were making, uh, incremental leaps year over year. It, it, relative to others, it wasn't doing as well as I had hoped it would do. But to this day, I still believe it's a strong basketball market that if done properly in the proper venue, you know, again, with a proper ownership group, that it could be successful. But the decision, there was just a lot of non-communication or miscommunication around the venue getting uh, done. And when you're a young league and a young team that has only played a, two years going into three years playing at a, at a specific venue and all of a sudden you're told, hey, you can't do that anymore. You need to find another place to play. And by the way, there are no other places to play, <laughs> you know, in the city. What do you do? Do you go to Mac and, and devalue that product and, and maybe not even get any court time because of all the stuff they have going on in the summers? Do you go to the Dave Andrzejczyk Arena and you can't play because the scoreboard's too low and you literally, an inbounds pass could hit it, <laughs> right? These are all things that people don't realize, but we did our homework and we, we went around. Or do you go to Burlington and maybe you stay in that region and trying to make it work? And then oh, there were some goods in those decisions, but then it just kept getting delayed. And then we just didn't hear and then didn't hear. Them. And finally, we just couldn't conduct business properly. And that franchise would just have been in, in purgatory for three, four, five years. And that's not good for the fans. It's not good for the players. It's not an experience. not good for the league. So we made a decision to, to leave. And um, I don't regret the decision one bit. It was the right business decision to do. I, I wish it would have been. You're a commissioner. Yeah, it's, it's my decision. I believed in it wholeheartedly, and I wouldn't change it for the world. And in many cases, the proof's almost in the pudding, is that, you know, we left in 2022, and nothing's happened yet to the building. It's 2024, and it may not get finished till 2026 or beyond. And... Um, would we like to return? I think in, in a perfect scenario, we would, which is a, a rebuilt and renovated arena, which I believe will happen. Mm -hmm. But then there's talks about that arena being primarily a, you know, a, a concert arena. Well, then, you know, that, I'll cross that bridge when we come to it, when right. that happens. But that does take away most weekends. And if you're a sports franchise, you want to play on prime nights. So um, I feel bad for the Hamilton basketball community because I see what, the CBL and our teams have done in the other markets we play in. I see what they've done in a Winnipeg where, you know, signups have gone 23% year over year and they attribute 19% of that to the, to the sea bears. And I've seen what's happening in Calgary and all these major markets. And I look at Hamilton and, and I, as a, as a resident or a former resident, I, I'm just like, what's happening? Like this should be happening here. Right. We should, first of all, have a mid-sized facility to play in mm -hmm. right, right off the bat. There should be a five to seven thousand seat arena anyways in a market of our size that would attract a, a ton of other things. And I know Michael had that plan, which sure. I would have loved. <laughs> quite been great. frankly, yeah. That's where our fans are. They're up the hill. Um, but I mean, without getting into the inner workings, it just it, for whatever reasons, things got extended or communication broke down. It happens. We're, we're in that position. We made a decision. Uh, I'm fine with it. Would I like to come back? Um, it's on my board. And when I present to our, you know, our, our ownership group, Hamilton is listed. 
and you know there's an asterisk because things have to happen mm -hmm. but hamilton is a is a market that we believe can be really successful and i'd love to mm -hmm. see it for the generations of fans that can actually look on the court and say i can be there one day it just made sense. I mean, a team in St. Catharines, a team in Hamilton, a team, you know, which kind of represents Toronto and yep. Scarborough. Uh, it just, yeah, it, it, it it's bothersome, and it's bothersome to the many people that, as you well know, represent oh, the yeah. basketball community here in Hamilton. Let me leave you on this. Let's bring up this a, a picture of something of, of, a, of a Hamiltonian. Yep. We'll say that's uh, kind of doing pretty well. And uh, I, I, I sh this is, what? Oh, this man. guy's blown up. I, I tell you, like, he looks like just a young, fresh-faced kid here. Now, that's going back to our inaugural year, I think, so 2019 or 2020. Uh, it might have been 2019 because 2020 we were in the bubble. Um, he would come with Nikhil, uh, his girlfriend, his buddies, and he'd sit courtside. He'd sit up in the stands. He would be open and welcoming to everybody. I, I couldn't be more excited about the success that that – the uh, man has had and, and the way he carries himself and what he's going to do for this country and what he's done for the country. And if you listen to Shea talk, he mentions Hamilton all the time. So in a, in a crystal ball, in a perfect world, the arena gets done and Shea is that, you know, multi-time all-star and maybe an MVP. And maybe there's a way to work with Shea and Nikhil and others to bring basketball back to Hamilton. Right, that's the way I think now. Interesting. Um, is that the way Shea thinks? I don't know. He's a busy man right now, sure. but he's got a lot of stuff to do. But I think what we've seen in my discussions in other markets with other similar type players is, you know, there hasn't been a lot of new money in basketball. Right? Uh, there's not a lot of old money. Sorry, in basketball, there's a lot of new money now, and I think a lot of these these athletes really want to give back to the communities they grew up in, whether it's Jamal in Kitchener or, mm -hmm. or Andrew Wiggins in, in Mississauga or McClure. Shane in Hamilton and Jamal mm -hmm. in, in Scarborough. And that ability to give back and be involved in the youth and be involved in professional sport is, is a big hook. And I think we have a, a really good opportunity for those individuals to be part of it. Mike, this has been a lot of fun to sit down and catch up with you. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to kind of follow your, you know, and put a microphone in front of you in that locker room back in those wild days with the Tiger Cats. And, you know, whether it, you working with the PA, we've had some opportunities there. You know, working as a a member of Filthy McNasty. Oh, yeah, we had some the, good times there too. Good times, you know, working in the restaurant industry, and, and and now to see you in this role now, like, I mean, it's amazing because you, yeah, you have been able to look back with us here, but I mean, your career is just it's still blossoming. I think it's just getting started. It really, really is, do. and it, and it's so awesome to to see you. And I know I'm not the only one that believes that because you know you've as I said you've set the table, you know, and I will call you that five star guy because you kind of did it all man wow. and but one led to the other yeah and that and it's been a treat to kind of watch it along the way so thank you for joining us here on the sports line podcast i really hope that you've kind of maybe uh set the stage for some other person to do the same thing and inspire someone so dude thank you so much thank for coming you, on. appreciate it. this has been great man and, and congratulations keep it going right on. Uh, five years from now i'll do it again right <laughs> on. look forward to it <laughs> folks we love talking sports from a local provincial and national perspective you know if you do know of an athlete team or event to promote Remote. The Sports Line Podcast wants you. Contact me on many of the CHCH social media platforms, and we'll get you right here on the cozy couch. We love it, just like Mike. Please hit that thumbs up, like, and subscribe button because we certainly do need your feedback and appreciate it as well. For the wonderful minds and hands that make this podcast possible, thank you for joining us, and we will see you tomorrow.